Uh, let me tell you about our ecclesia, first of all, because our ecclesia, when we bring love, uh, our voting members live on three continents and are in four different countries, our voting members. So when they bring love to you, it comes from afar. But additionally, there are brethren who call in on our Sunday meetings, who I would be remiss if I didn't bring their love. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, there's so many brethren that I'm not going to name them all. I'm going to name a couple of them because I have to, because they told me uh, that I need to mention them. So I'm taking my time for my comments to include them. Had I been not here today, I would have been on the Zoom Nigeria Monthly Fellowship. And the reason I told them I can't serve today or participate is because they get you up at 5 a.m. in the morning. And I knew that I had a, uh, you know, service this morning. I did not want to fall asleep on the platform in front of you. So <laughs> I, I said, please, uh, forgive me. Forgive me. Okay? Now, I want to tell you about um, those who specifically gave love that I should share. And one is Sister Jeannie Comer. Some of you know her. One is Sister Donna Mitchum, you know her. Uh, one is Sister Karina Butler, you know. And one is a brother, Edward Nakansa, who many of you know, but some of you don't. And I'll get back to Brother Edward in just a second. But I have to tell you that um, among the things that have happened recently that have been noteworthy, difficult, perhaps a challenge, is the fact that um, there is a sister who is in college. She lives in Zimbabwe. That's one of the many countries in Africa. And I always have to go through this because some of us who have not been to Africa don't realize that Africa is a continent as opposed to a country. And um, I have to tell you that uh, she is 22 years of age. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the memorial issues that uh, Brother Bob Brand did not raise, it may not be an issue for any of you, but one of the issues is, is it appropriate to take the memorial before you have water immersion? And for some of you, that's not an issue. But some maybe say, no, you got to have it first. And I could go, but I'm not going to go there with you. And the reason I mention that is because Sister Marilyn is going to symbolize her consecration, Lord willing, at the Pan-African Convention during the period April 8 to 11 in Ghana, West Africa, in person. She has met one Bible student face to face. Sister Mary, I'll tell you how old she is. She is 22 years of age. She found the truth online. <laughs> I will tell you what I told some of the brethren. In my many, many years of walking this way, I have never, never found any sister or any individual who is more focused in terms of telling you about the message. I will tell you what she said. I have to tell you this story. In fact, I'm tempted to just talk about her, but I'm not going to do that. But this is what she does. She is one of five daughters, and her uncle is a pastor. To make a long story short, she does not want to know anything about the systems, but she's respectful. <laughs> so she went to her uncle's church on one occasion, but she asked questions right there. I will tell you one of the things that she said. She said, you know, and it has to be with the scriptures. And she tells her uncle and those who were there, you know, the apostle said, of your own men, of your own selves, shall men arise speaking perverse doctrine. This is what she said. She's a killer. <laughs> She's a killer. You, I, you don't go any further. But I want to tell you something else. Marilyn is, had an experience yesterday, the day before yesterday. She's in college. Her residence, where she was, went up in flames. She lost everything except her laptop and her smartphone. She's on this, I'm sure she's on this service. And she has reached out, and brethren from all over the globe have reached out to her 
to encourage her. She's more of an encouragement. You've heard that before. She is an absolute encouragement to me. I, I have to tell you that I speak to her sometimes. We have meet, midweek meetings that start at 8 o'clock in the evening. Her time zone is seven hours ahead of ours. She calls in sometimes at 3 a.m. and doesn't get off to 4.30 a.m. That's, that's Marilyn. So she's met one sister in Christ. I have to tell you about Sister Sarah. Some of you know Sister Sarah Asari. Some of you know her personally, and I'll get to Sister Sarah in just a moment. Both Sister Marilyn and Sarah could be my granddaughters. They are of that generation. Sister Sarah has been consecrated 20 years. You do the math. I tell Brad when they ask me, how are you doing, Brother Homer? I say, I'm still here. Sister Sarah is still here. 20 years, granddaughter to age, consecrated, consecrated, single, consecrated, consecrated. So I told them I'm going to mention them in my discourse today, just so you'll know. But here's the last thing I have to do. And, uh, you know, if you get me to speak in Florida, you know I'm going to play the game with you. And what's the game? The game I'm going to get you is, how well do you know your brethren? I played this game last time around, oh, I guess it was around 2019 for the, uh, the October convention, I believe. But, you know. So what I said is, you know, if you really know your brethren, you would know that they travel a lot. I will tell you, I won't give you the precise number, but in this audience right here that I've seen, there have been approximately 20 individuals who have been to Pan-African activities in Ghana, West Africa. You, did you know that? I'll tell you something further. I'll give you two more, and, and you can figure out who I'm talking about. Most of them are sisters. Oh, did you know that? Ah. One of them was there in 2018, 2019, 2021, and Lord willing, if I'm there, she's there, she'll be there in 2023, four years in a row. I'll give you one more clue. One of them is a mother and a daughter that have been there on separate dates that are, I've seen at this convention. So that's enough of an introduction as to where I'm going. So let me tell you about my theme, which is, has been noted, women of the cloud. You know, if you guess, I'm going to talk about the ancient word. Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about the women of the cloud. And of course, in the book of Hebrews, it only lists two women by name, Sarah and Rahab the harlot. And, you know, I believe, I'm going to skip some of the scriptures, I'll just cite them, but I think that faith has always been foundational in terms of determining where we are going to be in terms of how our end result would be. We walk by faith. I could cite Hebrews 11, 1, 2, and 6 you want the reference there, that tells you something about faith. But I'm not going to go there because you know it well. What I will say is that um, there's a scripture that talks about the elders receive a good report. And I don't think that elders necessarily means male. Why? Because Sarah and Rahab were not male but they were part of those that received the good report. Think about that. You know, from time to time, questions have emerged. You know, what do you think? What's your opinion? Questions. I like, I like thus saith the Lord as best I can, because I can speculate as well as anybody else. But I try to focus upon what do the scriptures tell you? So here's one of the questions that sometimes comes up about interest, of interest. Some would say, well, do you think, for example, that Abraham, when he was going to offer Isaac as a burnt offering, told Sarah about it before he left? Look, I'll ask the question of any of the brethren, uh, uh, the male brethren. If you were going to do something like that, would you discuss it with your wife? <laughs> Here's another question. Uh, Rahab, the harlot, was she, was she a prostitute or was she an innkeeper? And I don't want to get into that discussion either, but I want you to understand that there are a lot of things we can talk about that you might not have a precise, thus saith the Lord, and maybe there's a different way of looking at it. 
So if you ask me my question, my opinion to those, I will tell you, really, I, I don't know. And is what I think really, really that important? They all had a good report. We know that those two had a good report. But my point is that uh, we need to think about how we can get a good report ourselves. We want to talk, however, about principles, concepts, not facts necessarily. I mean, and you do need facts. You need doctrinal points. But let me talk to you about three uh, scriptures in the New Testament that express what I consider to be a principle that should assist us in determining how we should act and guide ourselves. The first one was mentioned yesterday in a different context. I think it was mentioned uh, in the last discourse we heard. And it was Acts 10.34, Acts 10.34. I won't quote it except to say that the principle is that God is no respecter of persons. And what was the occasion that this uh, scripture came to the fore? Well, at that point in time, you know, poor, uh, Peter had seen the sheet ascending and descending. And he was told, Peter, rise and eat. And Peter understood that, you know, these are unclean animals, all kinds of things. I can't do that. I'm kosher. Well, what did God tell Peter, in effect? Or what did the voice from above say? He said, what God has cleansed, don't you call it unclean. That's a concept. That's a concept. And you know, we may have, all of us may have different degrees of baggage in terms of how we think things ought to be. We gotta be transformed. That was one of the themes that we have heard over and over during this convention. Let me give you another concept. It's found from Revelations 5, 9 and 10. Revelations 5, 9 and 10. I'm gonna read from the Amplified this time. And this is what it says. And they sang a new song of glorious, Redemption, saying, worthy and deserving are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of royal subjects and priests to our God, and they will reign on earth. What does that tell you? You know, I've been around long enough, so I say things that maybe I shouldn't say. But there, there have been brethren who have told me that, um, you know, oh, the truth is finally coming to Africa. And I, you know, I tell them about, well, gee, I think it might have begun some time ago when the Ethiopian eunuch was uh, on the scene. But, uh, you know, I don't need to go there with you, okay? Another scripture, Galatians 3, 28. Another concept, another principle. And it says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Now I'm coming close to what I want to talk about. And all these passages seem to support, again, that our standing with the Heavenly Father is based largely upon our faith as opposed to subjective criteria such as gender, language, national origin, etc. And so I submit that there are probably as many female members of the ancient worthies class as well as male. Numbers 19.9 reads as follows. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. We're going to suggest, as found in the harvest message, that these ashes illustrate as a remembrance and acknowledgement of the faithfulness of the ancient worthies, even unto death, that will be used during the kingdom to help cleanse the world of mankind from the defiling effects of Adamic sin, which they will have to overcome in order to progress up the highway of holiness. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we would wonder whether worthy women of old would not have had their collective experiences and demonstrated past faithfulness employed as examples for the human family. Perhaps 
especially to other women, in helping them successfully overcome the various defilements related to sin, which will be required of all who will walk up the highway of holiness and ultimately, if they're going to attain uh, everlasting life. So let us first consider our initial suggested woman from the cloud. And yeah, it's Ruth, the Moabitess, very familiar scripture, very familiar. In fact, she has a whole book dedicated to her, like Esther. So maybe there's something to that. I don't know, but that's just a thought. You don't have to take it as gospel. But uh, during a famine, and you know the narrative, in Bethlehem, her husband, Elimelech, of the tribe of Judah, took, you know, his wife, Naomi, and, uh, you know, her two sons, and they went to uh, Moab, a land of idolatry, something that, you know, I guess if he really had good faith, the faith, that's the husband's faith, he might have stayed where he was, but that's another story. And, um, you know, the narrative, after about 10 years, uh, you know, the husband died, the two sons that went there, they died, and then the familiar narrative, the two that, um, you know, Naomi witnessed to by her presence, by her uh, faith in God, she decided, no, it's time to go back home. And, of course, what happened? Well, you remember Ruth and Orpha and uh, that familiar passage, and treat me not to leave you, and so forth and so on. The point is, uh, Ruth determined that she was going to follow the God, the God of her mother-in-law, Naomi. That, that's amazing. It's, it, I'll just digress. It's, it's interesting that she should love her mother-in-law so much that she would do that. How many, how many daughters-in-law uh, would go and uh, be so close to their mother-in-law? But that's another story. Don't want to go there either. Uh, anyway, so what happened was that she went there and she took her mother-in-law's advice. <laughs> And ultimately, she uh, got involved with somebody named Boaz. And uh, you, know, you know the narrative also, how it came about. But what emerged from this relationship was that Ruth eventually married Boaz, and a son was born to them. And uh, you know, what we find from the record was that uh, his name was Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. And it was from David's family, which God chose as the line through whom the Messiah should come. The harvest message suggests also that Ruth might picture the Gentiles, who by a full consecration unto death, leaving their all, leave behind their earthly hopes, ambitions, interests, and as new creatures are taken into the family of God. And of course, during the kingdom, it would seem that Ruth's example of having left idolatry of Moab and cleaving to the God of Israel would be a wonderful witness to the world of mankind, especially since they would learn how honored she was to become part of the line through whom our Lord was born on the human plane. What an incentive it will be at that time during the kingdom for women to walk up the highway of holiness and learn about the same God that Ruth found so long ago. But you know, just as Ruth experienced the kindness of Boaz in making provision for her in the field, uh, she might be able to recall that um, how she felt when, uh, as a foreigner, he spoke to her so kindly and spoke about, you know, if you're a thirst, you can drink the water from the vessels that were there. And I can't help but think about the invitation to the world of mankind and that familiar text of Revelation 22, 17, Revelation 22, 17, where it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who is a thirst, etc., take of the water of life, etc." I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but the point is, that Ruth will be able to point to the human family the words of the typical Boaz to satisfy their needs, just as the antitypical Boaz is going to satisfy the needs of all. Let me move on to another suggested 
member of the cloud from the distaff side, if I can use that expression. But you know, it actually relates to two individuals. Two individuals. And you have to think about who I'm going to say. It's probably not the names that are on the tip of your tongue, so I'll tell you. They are Shipra and Pua. Who are they? <laughs> Let me quote from Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 21. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 21 from the NIV, and this is what it says. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And the midwives, because they feared God, he gave them females of their own. Incidentally, it appeals to us that they acted upon the same principle as did the persecuted apostles, as we read from Acts 4.19, Acts 4.19, when Peter asked the civil authorities whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Additionally, as consecrated spirit begotten brethren, we are called to obey the government and honor civic rulers, as noted in Romans 13, 1 to 5. Romans 13, 1 to 5. But should not fidelity to Caesar be a priority in our lives above doing the will of the Heavenly Father? You know, brethren have different prophetic views. They spend a lot of times in prophecy. And uh, look, I have to tell you about prophecy, you know. Uh, Look, my father, I have to digress for a second. My father got the truth in Jamaica, British West Indies in 1923. He was never part of the society. He was a member of the Church of England. And, uh, you know, there were some brethren who had never gone into the society. And he got the truth. He was walking down the road, and somebody said, draw near. And so my father went over there, and he got the truth. He didn't get volume one. He got a fifth volume. He got a fifth volume. And he read it from cover to cover. And he went home and he talked to my favorite aunt, who is also, was also single. And uh, he said, I have found the truth. And she read the fifth volume. Eventually, she came to the United States, but that's another story. The other eight, incidentally, went into the society. They went into the society. Only my dad and this aunt of mine embraced the truth. So uh, that's my background. Uh, sometimes I tell you a little bit about myself. I don't want to talk too much about myself, but you say, who's this guy up here that's doing all this talking? <laughs> anyway, but the point is, I talked about, you know, would I pass such a test? Because not everybody believes, for example, that there's going to be a set of trials coming upon us. That's something for your fellowship. I, I'm not going there with you either. But before concluding my remarks on Shipra and Pua, we would like to quote from Hebrews 11.35, using the Amplified as follows. And this is what it says. Women receiving back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured to death, refusing to accept release, offered on the condition of denying their faith, so that they would be resurrected to a better life. As I mentioned earlier, only Sarah and Rahab are specifically identified in Hebrews 11 as being part of the ancient worthy class. But obviously, there has to have been more because it's talking about women, even though they're not named. So 
Um, perhaps uh, there were a lot more. And um, we're going to comment further near the end of our remarks a little bit about this. But scripturally speaking, sisters don't necessarily render service from the platform, whereas brothers do. But you know, I really don't know how many of us, how many brothers would dare say, you know, I think there are going to be more brothers who are going to make their calling election sure than sisters. I want to sit down. I want to be in the audience when I hear a brother give that discourse. <laughs> and then I'll ask, what's the basis for that judgment? Is that thus saith the Lord or is that conjecture? Let me go back again, though, about Shipra and Pua's Pure, uh, faith was noteworthy. And you know, commentators vary as to whether they were of Hebrew background or not. But they probably heard and believed in the promise made to Abraham, including Israel's deliverance from bondage in the fourth generation, the fourth generation, I'll cite Genesis 15, 16, the generation of children then being born. And surely they did observe the miraculous birth rate among the Hebrew women. And though living in the midst of an idolatrous society, they trusted God. And they believed that deliverance would ultimately occur. And that prompted their refusal to cooperate in the drowning of the males. And that facilitated God later to raise up Moses and to bring about that promised deliverance. And we certainly assert that their faith in Jehovah and in his promises qualify them to be members of the cloud of witnesses. According to Leviticus 12, 6 to 8, Leviticus 12, 6 to 8, talks about the need for sacrifice to be made at the birth of a child. And I could tell you something about Simeon, but that's the reference to Simeon. But I want to talk about someone else from Luke chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. I want to talk about Anna. Anna, a prophetess from the tribe of Asher. I'm going to submit that she's possibly another likely ancient worthy who devoted her life full time to godly service in the temple, fasting and praying night and day. You know, her age limited her physical ability from carrying out the heavier chores that younger women could perform. But God blessed her devotion because she gave thanks to the Lord. She married, according to the scriptures, at a young, as a young woman in her teens. But after seven years, her husband died. And being a widow for 84 years, she was over 100 by the time Mary brought forth Jesus into the temple. The sorrows and suffering uh, that she witnessed among the multitudes of devout Jews who faithfully came to the priests developed in her probably a sympathy for their plight. And I would submit that Anna probably represented a number of Israelites who were, shall we call, the salt which preserved the masses from the festering corruption that was in effect during the time that our Lord lived. You know, we talk about how things are terrible this day, these days. It was bad back then when our Lord came on the scene. It was bad back in Noah's day. And, you know, our, 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 our focus a lot of times is in our immediate environment. It's always been bad, friends, ever since Eden. It's been bad, bad. Anyway, day by day, she would speak of Jesus, whom her eyes had seen. And like Simeon, Anna's age precluded her from being present for our Lord's earthly ministry. And therefore, as I submit, she might likely be a member of the ancient worthies, as opposed to being a spirit begotten, follower of the master, and eligible to run for the mark of the prize of the high calling. Let me offer another co comment by quoting a well-known Bible student's text as follows. I'm going to quote it. You know it, but I want to quote it for another purpose. 
is from Acts 3, 19 to 21. Acts 3, 19 to 21. And this is what it says. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, for your sins shall be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall, the Lord Jehovah, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So no, I did not quote that passage uh, to discuss whether the times of restitution commenced in 1874 or is a future event. I mean, I have my own view on that, but that's not the purpose of me uh, quoting that. But rather, since Anna is described as a prophetess, does this Acts passage limit such a proclamation to male prophets from Old Testament times? I mean, as consecrated, spirit-begotten brothers and sisters, are we not all privileged to proclaim to others the blessings of the times of restitutions, or is that just a male prerogative? You know, in thinking about my remarks for today, it occurred to me that probably, if I were to ask, you would have other women that you might have cited that come to mind that you might have said, well, I think this one is probably going to be someone that might be a part of that uh, class, such as maybe Hannah, uh, Deborah the judge and prophetess, Moses' mother, Jochebed, Rebecca, Esther, just to name a few. And that may well be. But earlier we quoted Hebrews 11.35, and we used the Amplified, I'm not going to repeat it for want of time, but what it does tell us is that, you know, these women receive their dead raised to life again. That's in that passage. You know, 1 Kings 17, 17 to 24, 1 Kings 17, 7, 17 to 24, tells about the widow of Zarephath, whose son Elijah resuscitated. And 2 Kings 4, 32 to 37. 2 Kings 4, 32 to 37, relates the account of the Shumanite woman whose son Elisha uh, raised. And certainly they may be among the women to whom Paul was referring in this Hebrews 11 account. But you know, there's another suggestion from the Harvest Message, page, uh, volume 6, page 705 volume 6, page 705, that appeals to me as to the identity of these women. And so I'm going to quote it in part, and this is what it says. The apostle would have us know that the wives, mothers, and daughters in Israel, whose faith in the Lord was such as to lead them to sympathize and to cooperate with the men who engaged in these warfares and sacrifices were participants with their husbands, sons, and fathers, and by encouraging them to faithfulness, became sharers with them in the sacrifices of faith. And by faith, look forward into the future and realize the better resurrection that would ultimately come to the Lord's faithful. Looking by the eye of faith, look, and by faith, look forward unto the future and realize the better resurrection that would ultimately come to the Lord's faithful. Yeah, uh, and looking by, the res looking by the eye of faith down to the future, they in faith, that's the point, receive their dead raised to life again or by resurrection, revised version. And who will dispute that if the faith of Abraham when willing to offer up Isaac, that's his son, was acceptable to God, the faith of wives, mothers, and daughters in Israel, who fully entered into the spirit of the male representatives in the sufferings, wars, endurances, etc., would be equally pleasing to the Lord. Let me conclude. 
We spent most of our time discussing various heroines who were not privileged to become part of the Bride of Christ. But our major intent this morning was to remind us that faith in God and his promises to restore the human family to all that was lost in Eden since sin entered in the world, no matter how long it takes, it will occur, no matter how bleak circumstances appear now. And so we should gain inspiration from the example of the worthy ones of the past as we persevere along the narrow way, this Christian race course. Much endurance is necessary in conjunction with our faith. We read from 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for the moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look at the things which are seen, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We, like the ancient worthies, male and female, have trying experiences from which the Lord does not deliver us. By perseverance and following devotedly in Jesus' footsteps, ultimately, we will attain to the heavenly glory and assist in the restoration, rest, restoring of all that was lost in Adam because of sin. May we resolve to be faithful until the end of our course and therefore participate in the great joy of helping to end earth's weary night when the church is complete. Amen.